connecting. We're connecting like uh, the 50 or so, 100 people. So. And we are live and welcome back to National Spectrum Management Association 2020 online. We're super pleased to have back one of our uh, resident, I'm putting that in air quotes, experts, Harvey List. Uh, Harvey is a, an astronomer with the uh, National Radio uh, Astronomy Observatory in Charlottesville, Virginia. He's tied to uh, all the all the uh, all the folks you'd expect, NRO, uh, NRAO, the Green Bank Observatory, um, and uh, on and on. And so I'm pleased to see that Harvey's back uh, uh, and updating us on a, a whole host of big issues that are underway. And and Harvey, welcome and thanks for being with us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I always appreciate this, and it's extremely valuable and informative to me. Fantastic. Well, we'll, uh, we'll uh, look forward to hearing your presentation, and obviously people can put uh, questions in the chat on the right, and we'll also just uh, open up questions on the, on the back end of this as well. Thanks so much, Harvey, and go for it. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to start out with some numbers, some hard numbers, a little bit wonkish. Uh, tell you a little bit about radio astronomy before getting into its spectrum management. So the radio astronomy unit of power flux density is, is a Jansky, and I'll show you Jansky later, Jansky the person. And it's a very low level of power flux density, right? It's 100 dB below typical radio communication service levels. And it's even far below the noise levels, even in the best uh, super cold detectors. But in fact, a, a one Jansky radio source is actually quite a strong one these days, and deep observations are done with RMSs of micro Janskys, and I'll show you some of those as well. Um, so how do you get sensitivity? Well, uh, in the normal detectors that we use that do coherent detection, the factors that, that matter are the collecting area, the observing time, and the bandwidth, and the observing time and the bandwidth enter as their square roots. So what are these sensitive to? Well, the, the collecting area, the laws of physics and the laws of men, right? How much steel can you actually put in the ground for the amount of money that you can get? Given that, for instance, it's impractical to build a steerable antenna that's bigger than the GBT, the 100 meter telescope that I'll show you in a couple of minutes. Um, the observing time, how often do you get interrupted? Right? How much can you accumulate and add coherently? You've got to master your systematics to add, add this time. And the bandwidth, this is spectrum management, right? How much spectrum do you have? or can you perhaps even find? This is one of the differences between what, what I do and what most of you do. Um, I have to admit that I don't always observe within my allocations for reasons that I'll explain. So you want angular resolution, you've got to be able to tell two things apart. As you, as you know from operating antennas, the, the angular resolution is, is a ratio, it's the wavelength divided by how big your collecting instrument is. Um, if you go to high frequencies, you can get quite high resolution with rather small dishes. But at low frequency and long wavelength, if you want to achieve high angular resolution, you may need uh, more than more size than a single structure can give you. Beyond all that, um, you've got to, we're dealing with nature, right? And the phenomena that we observe uh, occur at frequencies that nature chooses, the laws of physics. So nature picks the frequency at which natural phenomena occur and the bandwidths they occupy. But beyond that even, expansion of the universe determines the frequency at which the phenomenon can be observed because things uh, shift in frequency, as I mean, even cell phones are subject to the Doppler effect, but the universe is expanding on very large scales and the most distant detected objects have redshifts of about a factor of seven or greater, which means that the radiation you receive is at a frequency which is one plus seven or eight times lower than the frequency at which it was emitted. And when you look all the way back to, to as far back as we can go, which is the Big Bang radiation, the, the Big Bang radiation that we see is not actually at the beginning of time, it's a few hundred thousand years after the, in, the origin of the universe, and it's at a redshift of about 3,000. So in terms of looking back to to, to, the, to the origin of the universe, the most distant objects that we have are, are quite distant, but they're a long way from being at the origin of time. Um, sources of cosmic radio waves are mostly steady. Of course, you know about pulsars that blink on and off, uh, and transient events like supernovae do occur, 
but the cosmic emissions themselves are incoherent emission and noise-like. Okay, there's no signal to lock onto. You can detect these things and you can integrate on them, but you don't demodulate them. Uh, and as I said, there's what, what, the thing that we lock onto here is our faith in the scientific method that the longer we observe with better instruments, the better results we will get. But the point is that our emissions are noise-like. The, the signals, the maps of the sky that we make are more noise at some place, at some frequency, at some time. Our signals are actually noise. So what do radio telescopes look like? Um, on, on the left is the 100 meter uh, Green Bank telescope in Green Bank. I was the project scientist for a while during the construction of that telescope. It's one of the heaviest uh, movable objects on the surface of the planet. Maybe there are, maybe there are uh, tankers that weigh more than this once they're full of oil. But as far as moving structures on land go, the GBT is, is right up there. Um, other telescopes that work primarily at higher frequencies can be quite small and, and tucked into a nice dome like the 12 meter ARO observatory at right. Um, once a telescope gets bigger than about 100 meters, you build a spherical reflector and you move the feed around in the reflector. This is the 500 meter so-called fast uh, telescope that's recently was dedicated in China. Um, in the previous iteration of this talk, I showed a similar instrument, but in fact, that similar instrument uh, collapsed finally in December of 2020, right around the same time, within about 10 days of the time that our, our former home at the Holiday Inn in Roslyn uh, was, was demolished. These things happened, I think if you go on YouTube there, these videos are about 10 days apart from each other last December. So in other cases, when you build a, an, a telescope of many antennas, uh, at the left, you've got the very large array, which is in New Mexico, 27, 25 meter antennas. This is the most compact configuration. They move along railroad tracks um, with on pads that are spaced in the ratio of about square root of 10 apart. Uh, the VLA observes at frequencies uh, from 58 to 50,000 50, megahertz, with, with gaps, but the coverage is complete from one to 50 gigahertz. Uh, on the right is the Atacama large millimeter wave array, Alma at 16,000 feet in the north of Chile in the, the high Chilean desert. And it works between 30 gigahertz and 950 gigahertz with gaps. Now you'll notice of course that both of these are in very barren uh, environments. You don't talk about clutter loss if you want to calculate interference to the VLA or to ALMA. Um, and the other thing to remember is that both of these are subject to very high and dry uh, conditions, so you don't use the standard atmosphere either. It's often a very hard sell to, uh, to get people who do interference calculations with radio astronomy to take into account the particular conditions that actually occur. This is what the uh, the, teles the antennas look like when they're moved, just to give you an idea of the scale of these things. Uh, the 25 meter VLA antennas at left on their transporter, it, it, it reminds me of one of these ants, right? Who, who you Occasionally you see some newspaper article about how the ant can carry so much more than its own weight. And that's what the picture on the left reminds me of. On the right uh, is the transporter for the uh, ALMA antennas. The ALMA antennas are actually moved on roads rather than along tracks. Um, here's a map that IUCAF maintains that I made of radio telescopes throughout the world. It doesn't really show all of them because some of the telescope substations are not shown. But I think, I think there are something like 130 or 140 entries in this map. And you've got a URL up there and it's got about, six, it's, it's got about 65,000 views over time. So I think it's my greatest EPO effort. Um, as it, okay, I, this, this is an example of how you observe things that are even bigger than the resolution you can achieve on the surface of the Earth. Uh, parallax is, is a fairly well-known phenomenon. And what this is illustrating is that when the Earth is on opposite sides of its orbit around the sun, you use the VLA to make a very high resolution image of something which is far away on the other side of the galaxy. And by comparing the picture that you make in April and the picture that you make in October, 
what you see is that the object in the galaxy appears to move with respect to the background of quasars that are also in the field and they are much more distant. So this is just an example of parallax. And because you know the, uh, the radius of the Earth's orbit, by looking at the angle by which the object in the galaxy appears to move against the background, you can tell exactly how far away it is. And so this is used to map the galaxy. And this is done typically in the 6.67 gigahertz line of methanol that, that Mitch alluded to, and unfortunately is protected only by footnote and not by allocation. It's a unique resource. Uh, another example in this, uh, I, what I'm going to show you next is a, an exa another example of VLBI resolving the shadow of a black hole. So what you've got here is a Hubble Space, Im Hubble Space Telescope picture of a galaxy, which is represented by that bright spot at the upper left. It's an extremely massive galaxy that has sunk to the bottom of the potential well in a cluster of, extreme, of other galaxies. The cluster is very, very massive, and it has an enormous potential well at the bottom that harbors this very, very massive galaxy that has something like a thousand times the mass of our own galaxy. Um, at the center of the galaxy, at the center of the Virgo cluster, is a black hole. And the, the, blue, uh, the blue jet that you see shooting out to the bottom right is what happens when the matter accretes around that black hole. It has to shed its angular momentum that it had before it fell in. And the way it does that is by forming a jet, which is expelled at relativistic speeds out of the center of the galaxy. And then you can see the structure inside that jet, which is, you, you know, you can see clearly that it's getting wider and further apart. It's not perfectly collimated. It's not a pencil, it's a fan. And where it meets the intergalactic medium, you see structure as energy is dip dissipated in turbulence, okay? Uh, in fact, you only see one side of this jet because that's the side of the jet that's coming towards you. And the motion of the jet, the particles in the jet is so close to, uh, to the speed of light that the radiation is boosted by a huge factor. There's also a jet on the other side, but conversely, its radiation is shifted and dimmed by exactly the same amount to the point where you only see the beam on one side. A couple of years ago, um, VLBI resolved the shadow of a black hole in the center of this M87 galaxy uh, in a picture that got quite a bit of press. This is, this is an image of radiation focused by the black hole gravity in, into the image of this ring. Um, and this image was so convincing that two other guys who had nothing to do with making the picture won the Nobel Prize in physics for discovering black holes last year. Um, one thing that I always like to stress when I discuss radio astronomy and the origins of radio astronomy is the connection with communications, the connections with Bell Labs. Um, you know, the most famous discovery in radio astronomy was the discovery of the Big Bang, the origin of the universe that settled the question of how the universe was born and uh, when it originated. Uh, so Bob Wilson and Arno Penzias discovered this mysterious isotropic three Kelvin approximately signal at eight gigahertz in the wilds of Homedale, New Jersey. And what they were trying to do was to separate the noise communications through a satellite communications link budget in 1964. So here's a picture of Jansky in his field in Homedale and also the horn, uh, which is only located a few miles away. So the point here is that Jansky discovered radio astronomy in 1932 and about 30 years later, Bell Labs hired radio astronomers to use their expertise to settle, to try to describe the, uh, the noise contributions to their link budget. So it, it's, it's a tremendous symmetry, and it, it, it's very important to recognize the, uh, the debt that radio astronomy plays to communications technology. Okay, so, Here's a map, actually, of the Big Bang. And this is a map from, from uh, the Planck satellite that worked at the L2 point, the Lagrange 2 point, out in deep space. Um, and this map has had a lot of things subtracted from it to show the micro-Kelvin level fluctuations that are superimposed on the average 2.728 Kelvin level. And it's from the study of the statistics of these fluctuations 
that modern cosmology is done because these fluctuations are the seeds of all of the structure that you see now in the current universe. If, if, if this map had not had this structure, we would, we would not be here. We would have had a structureless universe. But these things eventually grew to become the visible objects that we, that we speak of today, the galaxies, and of course, including ourselves. Okay, so that's, that's radio astronomy. Uh, let me show you an example of spectrum. And then once we get, once we talk a little bit about spectrum, I'll tack management on, and then we'll be talking about spectrum management. Um, here's, here's another object uh, in space. And what this is, is it's a disk. Uh, imagine, imagine that when you look when you look at a donut edge on, when you look toward the edges of the donut, you see more donut than when you look toward the middle, and that's why this thing is brighter on the outside. It's a disc, but the way you see it in this picture is it's limb brightened because there's just more stuff around the edges. And people took a spectrum of some of the material uh, uh, toward this protostellar disc. This thing is much larger than uh, the solar system. This thing is of, is of the size um, sort of from the sun out to where the comets live now, okay? The planets, if this thing eventually makes planets, will form well inside of the outer limits of this thing. But in the meantime, they took a spectrum of the gas, and what they found in the spectrum of the gas were common salts like sodium, sodium chloride and potassium chloride. And it was, it was kind of a jokey picture, a uh, jokey paper, just pointing out that they had detected all of these things. The spectra, as you can see, are extremely complicated. This is a bit of the spectrum that's about two gigahertz wide from 214 to 216 gigahertz. But look at the noise level, right? The, the, the signals are measured in millijanskis, and the noise level is a tiny fraction of a millijansky. Okay. So that's, that's the point really of this, not that the salts exist, but that we can get down to the low levels needed to detect them. Well, a lot has happened. Okay, so that was spectrum. Let's tack, let's tack the word management on now and talk about spectrum management. Um, quite a bit has happened in the last uh, couple of years since I spoke. And the biggest thing probably was work 19 that occurred in Sharm El Sheikh during October and November of 2019. And at any given time, there were from five to probably eight radio astronomers in attendance at this thing, trying to uh, defend radio astronomy's interest. The picture at left is actually a sunrise picture taken from my bedroom window in the Sheraton at Charm, while I was, where I had the sad duty to spend four days, every, every one of which was, I think, as gloriously uh, sunny as, as the one that's illustrated here. And then, of course, you would plunge into huge you would plunge into huge meetings in air, in aircraft hangar like buildings, straining to see any kind of a picture uh, on the screen at the middle. So that's how you would spend your days. Uh, I got to the beach three times during the entire month that I was in Charm, three times during the day. Okay, another thing that that the organization. Uh, the IUCAF that I run, and I'll say a little bit about that in just a moment. We had a summer school in South Africa right before the pandemic struck. Uh, South Africa suffered its first case of COVID during our meeting. Um, the meeting was near Cape Town. The first case was in Durban. But in fact, 55 people came and we did a summer school uh, trying to, uh, to disseminate knowledge about spectrum management to astronomers, to prospective spectrum managers, to local regulators, because uh, you know, spectrum management is not easy. If it were easy, maybe we wouldn't be here. And every every discipline's got the things that are peculiar to it. Radio astronomy is a little more uh, esoteric than some. There's no certification program. Perhaps the closest thing is the schools that we run, but we just give people dinner, not a certification at the end. Um, so what about spectrum management? Well, you know, everybody's traditional strategy is to rely on their frequency allocations. And for science in general and radio astronomy in particular, the most important allocations are the ones that are subject to footnotes uh, 5.340 and US uh, 246. These, these, are the, these are the footnotes that say that 
that assignment of transmission, transmitter frequencies really should not be assigned, shouldn't, are not allowed to be assigned in these bands. The way the ITUR says it, it's all emissions are prohibited, but in fact, there's no way to, in, to prohibit all emissions because there are unwanted emissions from other bands that encroach upon these. But the point of showing this slide is that uh, below 80 gigahertz, the amount of spectrum that's specifically set aside for science, okay, this does not include shared bands, is between one and 2%. It's not very much. Um, it increases greatly above about 80 gigahertz um, because basically radio astronomy got there first. But another difference between the spectrum above and below about 80 gigahertz is that radio astronomy has very, very little shared spectrum below 80 gigahertz. Most of the allocations that radio astronomy has below 80 gigahertz, um, well, certainly below 70, it gets a little muddy between 70 and 80, uh, are, are, the, are the passive band allocations. Those are the ones that, that we actually have assigned to us. Um, at the higher frequencies, there is not only more passive spectrum, but there's also more shared spectrum. Most of the shared spectrum is basically usable by radio astronomy for this for the reason that it, it has yet to be occupied by the active services. But when the services with which we share in those bands start to turn on, like now for car radar, we can expect to lose uh, some of the utility that we presently enjoy. Um, yeah, so our shared bands are. Uh, the shared bands with primary allocations to radio astronomy are typically limited to sharing with terrestrial services because compatibility can be very difficult in direct line of sight. And with, with uh, satellite services, it's very hard to avoid direct line of sight. So another, another strategy that we've adopted in radio astronomy uh, is, is just to... Uh, well, these are coordination zones, right? But we, but we've, we've, they've evolved into what we call radio quiet zones. And some of the world's major telescopes are wrapped in radio quiet zones. There are, there are a dozen or more that are described in this ITU report that's freely available on the ITR website. And we're just in the process of uh, revising it. I, I, the U.S. National Radio Quiet Zone was the first. It's written in the federal regulations. It's 13,000 square miles. It's got close to 600,000 people living in it. Uh, I don't think anything like this could be created now, but it was created in 1958. Charlottesville, where I am, is just on the very edge, uh, the eastern edge. It's not symmetrical, as you can see, about the GBT, which is the, uh, the, the marker at left. Uh, it's shifted slightly to the east because there's more there's more population there. Um, the, the seminal point about the National Radio Quiet Zone is that it prescribes power limits at all frequencies, including the frequencies that are not allocated to radio astronomy. In in the bands that are not allocated, the criteria are not nearly as strict as the radio astronomy protection criteria in the allocated bands. But in fact, restrictions on the transmissions at all frequencies do exist in the radio quiet zone. And that's an innovation of spectrum management. Uh, from time to time, it becomes, every once in a while, I'll run into somebody at the FCC who doesn't actually realize that the national radio quiet zone regulates uh, the emissions at all frequencies. But this is this is the this is the important thing here. Some of you may have uh, your own personal experiences dealing with uh, the National Radio Quiet Zone for the installation of your transmitters. Most are approved; only a small fraction, a small number, uh, require close coordination. An interesting thing now is that SpaceX is selling fixed service ground stations, fixed satellite service ground stations, and the end user license that ships in the box to people says that they're responsible for everything needed to operate it, including in, by implication, uh, spectrum management, but it doesn't say anything about it explicitly. If you go to the SpaceX website, if you went to the SpaceX website one month ago and you typed in the uh, zip code of the GBT and you ask, when can I have service at this, uh, 
at this longitude and latitude, they would they would just uh, they would tell you and send you an end user license for you to sign. Say just return this and we'll ship you we'll ship you a, a box. So we're in the process of coordinating with them to make sure that something like that doesn't exactly happen, but it's ongoing. Um, another thing about the Radio Quiet Zone is the GBT is protected by something called the West Virginia Radio Astronomy Zoning Act. And because spectrum management is really the per limited, it's the prerogative of the FCC, the West Virginia Radio Astronomy Zoning Act doesn't exactly uh, do spectrum management, but it does limit the operation of unshielded electrical apparatus, things like unintentional radiators within 10 miles of an observatory. It, it's in assistance. You couldn't, you couldn't, for instance, set up a sawmill across the street from the GBT. Uh, the, the effectiveness of a radio quiet zone is based on coordinating away those frequencies that are used on the ground. I think that's pretty apparent. What's happening now is that there's quite a bit of blurring of the distinction between frequencies or allocations that are used on the ground and in the air. Because these days we've got eSIMs, UAV, HAPS, HIBs, uh, non-GSO operations in the GSO band, and even something as far afield as the AST and science uh, petition for LEO downlink in 5G. Um, let me not, let me not, let me just brush over this. Um, NRIO files whenever, uh, whenever, it, whenever it feels the need. Um, Recently, last year, we had the case of the, the petition for rulemaking of Aerojet, Aeronet Global Communications. Uh, something very like this is on the work agenda, agenda item 110, uh, non-safety applications of airborne mobile. But basically, the idea is to do uh, an in-air mesh network with connections to ships, be connections between planes and ships, uh, planes and the ground, planes and everything, okay? And when you do a calculation like this, the transmitters are fairly high power. You find out that if the transmitter on the plane is pointed at a radio observatory, it can interfere at distances of a couple hundred kilometers. So this blurring of frequencies used on the ground and in the air is gonna be quite problematical uh, for the efficacy of radio quiet zones, if not for radio astronomy as a whole. Um, a word about satellites, because the discussion over satellites has taken things in entirely new directions. Um, there's been quite a lot of publicity of the, uh, the solar reflections from the Starlink constellations, not so much from uh, OneWeb. Uh, OneWeb has launched fewer satellites. It launches in a different way. And this, the satellites have been just generally less visible. But the, uh, the, trains, the trains of SpaceX satellites have gotten quite a bit of press. And they've, they've highlighted the fact that radio spectrum regulators that, that license and authorize these things have become the gatekeepers to the optical appearance of the night sky. This is collateral damage, negative externalities. And it's, uh, we're going to explore a little bit where this takes us. You know, just I think this was yesterday or two days ago. This this picture, right? The typical picture that illustrates the sky now is a satellite trail, not just uh, the Big Dipper. Uh, on the other, on the previous slide, I might point out the optical astronomers or amateur astronomers, astronomers who look at light, uh, call this photobombing. And as I said on the previous slide, a few percent even of the HST's images are photobombed now. And of course, this can only increase. Well, you know, radio astronomy had its aha moments uh, with satellites much earlier. The, the, the realizations that somehow optical and, optical and astronomers are coming to now uh, with these unintended effects of satellites were experienced by radio astronomers in the 70s and 80s and 90s. When, <coughs> when the GPS satellites were first launched, when GLONASS was first launched, um, they were unfiltered. They were just, they were basically digitally modulated un, un, unfiltered signals or lightly filtered signals. And they caused quite a bit of interference to radio astronomy throughout these, these several decades. 
Um, there, there was a famous case where when, when this picture at the right of GLONASS was being taken at Jodrell Bank, um, there were Russian astronomers in attendance and they were claiming that the signals that were being observed couldn't be GLONASS. But just at that time during the test, there was a widely publicized failure of the GLONASS system and it had to be taken down. And just at that moment, the interference disappeared. So it sufficed, it served to convince everybody that in fact, the interference that was being observed was, was GLONASS. Um, I won't harp on this, but this little band that you see, this narrocated band, there a blue, blue outlined band, um, was this, as soon after Iridium was launched, it was discovered that Iridium was interfering in this band. And despite our best efforts uh, now, 20 years later, Iridium is still interfering in this band. And the spectrum at right shows the Iridium signal within its band and then the wings, the broad wings uh, that result from fifth and seventh order intermodulation distortion in the amplifiers. And then outlined it left the radio astronomy band and some of the uh, unwanted emissions that are falling in it. So this is still going on. And we've taken all the recourse we can at the ITUR. Uh, European radio astronomers have complained at the FCC, and there's just simply been no relief whatsoever. Okay, so why am I here? Why was I so happy to uh, accept Joe's gracious invitation to speak? Well, it's the point that access to spectrum is eroding for science, not just astronomy. And there are many, many reasons for this, right? Uh, new active systems are prodigious spectrum users. So here are examples of what SpaceX and OneWeb do at K-band, uh, 5G at, at two different works, HAPS, right? Modern radio communication systems are not fixed links that take a 10 megahertz channel and you can coordinate them away because they just don't point at your telescope. These are systems that are widely distributed on earth, widely distributed in the sky, and widely distributed in spectrum. And so we just have to learn to deal with them because they're not doing anything that they're not permitted to do. Um, the scale of new systems is orders of magnitude larger, right? Iridium launched the water 100 satellites, and now we're talking more than 100 times larger than that. Um, the number of synthetic aperture radar mappers that used to be measured onesies and twosies as the flagship missions of you know, billions of dollar missions from national space agencies. You've got uh, a half dozen or more commercial startups, each one of which is planning to launch a constellation of perhaps three dozen of these. So a handful is growing to one or 200. Um, in many cases, the unwanted emissions from these systems are not adequately controlled. Some of you must be aware of the fight over the unwanted emissions, uh, the permissible unwanted emission levels for 5G into the uh, passive band at 23.6 to 24 gigahertz. That was the subject of a huge knockdown drag out fight at work 19. Uh, it was a very depressing experience for the uh, EESS, the remote sensing spectrum managers. Um, and active services wind up making services that are of relatively marginal use to astronomy. They, they protect some tiny band that we've got allocated, and then they gobble up a huge swath of spectrum just to do what they are intended to do. And there's the potential that, you know, we, our, tiny band is, is, our tiny band is defended, but the huge band is lost. Um, and another thing is that the United States has been leading efforts in several ways to, um, denature the protections for the passive service bands, especially above 95 gigahertz, but at the work, uh, but at the ITUR in Geneva over a slightly wider range of frequencies. Um, they've really been dragging us uh, through the mud in, and it's, it's something that's very threatening to the passive services. It's a kind of existential threat that the passive service bands uh, might be lost. So what's going on? There's less unoccupied spectrum, right? These are the natural trends. There's gonna be more unwanted emissions. 
it's going to be harder to use, you know, it's harder to use spectrum when it's adjacent to strong communication signals. We've seen several examples of that at this meeting today. Um, we've got weakening of spectrum protections in the passive bands. Blurring, this business of blurring and mixed use of terrestrial air and spaceborne. And then, of course, this business of the collateral damage of the radio spectrum regulators uh, authorizing these mega constellations. Orbital debris, which is something the FCC actually uh, is concerned with, but the desecration of the dark night sky, which, which they're not. So um, for the first time, the optical astronomers are now threatened in a way that they hadn't been before. Um, and they're and and the source of the source of the problem, as, as it appears, is the same radio spectrum regulators with whom radio astronomers have been dealing for for quite some time. So, the optical astronomers, in the absence of any protection for the dark night sky and optical astronomy, have begun to convene meetings um, just to, just to discuss this, to try to get a handle on the general problem. And radio astronomy has been included because the rubric that astronomy has adopted is dark and quiet, right? The dark part is the optical and the quiet is more the radio. So there was a meeting uh, in the Canaries, of course, virtually last October, a workshop that produced uh, some outputs that are linked here. And these outputs, uh, the, dark, the output of the dark and quiet skies workshop uh, produce recommendations for the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space held its scientific and technical subcommittee meeting in the time that was just concluded about uh, two weeks ago. So they considered two recommendations that had come out of the workshop. And the point of these recommendations that were considered at the UN is that they extend outside the regime of frequency management. The problem for radio astronomy is that at a venue like the FCC or a venue like the ITUR, they are concerned with a very uh, specific mandate. They protect the use of allocated frequencies, but they don't have any mandate to protect science as a whole. You know, Mitch actually touched a bit on this yesterday when he discussed whether or not uh, the definition of harmful interference should change according to the subject matter of, of the field that was to which the interference is being generated, right? To some extent, that's done now because the definition of harmful interference that he quoted is that from the ITUR, the FCC doesn't try to redefine harmful interference. And every radio service gets to redefine, gets to define its own protection criteria. So to some extent, the criteria for harmful interference are subject particular, but they don't, they don't discuss the actual content they only discuss what that, how that service feels its own operations are affected. Anyway, what the workshop recommended and what COPUS considered were two recommendations that concern these, these things. They, non -GS, I'll read them. Non-GSO satellites should be required to be able to avoid direct illumination of radio telescopes and radio quiet zones, especially the radar and other high power satellite applications that are capable of burning out radio astronomy's receivers. And the, the, just the same way that radio quiet zones have the innovation that they, re that they uh, regulate all frequencies, these recommendations are not frequency specific, right? These, are, these go beyond the use of allocated bands to try to protect science. Um, and, and what they say is that at least the satellites that are launched should be able to avoid illuminating radio telescopes in quiet zones. And they should also not inadvertently uh, illuminate the radio telescopes in quiet zones with their side lobes because the aggregations of large numbers of these 
um, could really overwhelm radio astronomy. And they moved beyond. So the recommendations were made and presented to the UN in the COPUS forum. Um, what's going to happen to them is undetermined at the moment. The UN uh, COPUS is actually considering these matters for the first time, and it's wondering how to deal with them. So we will be on the program in the future, but I have to say that stay tuned for, for uh, whether or not we can actually get anything like this done. I, I have to say that among, there were two radio astronomy recommendations made, but on the optical side, um, much more subject matter was considered and there were probably a hundred recommendations of various kinds. So ours get considered and they're relatively simple, but they're in a basket right now with about a hundred other things that COPUS was asked to deal with. Okay, so I'm done now. And uh, my last slide is just a resource that somebody can look at um, for some links, uh, bodies that are concerned with protection of the radio spectrum for astronomy. And my last slide, well, thanks for inviting me and long live NSMA. Thank you, I'm done. I think maybe Joe is gonna pop in here in a second, Harvey, but there are a couple of questions in the chat if you'd like me to read them or if you can see them. Um, the first one was from Andrew Clegg. Was the aerial picture of Alma taken by a high altitude drone? Uh, I, I don't know. It is actually possible to see Alma from any number of mountains uh, in the surrounding terrain. You know, although we don't give tours of Alma, it's relatively easy to take a tour, just a commercial tour, and go up in the hills around Alma and look down on it. So it, it's quite possible, but I, I can't say. So we'll mark that as Oh, and then there's George. Yeah. Have you heard any unidentified emissions? Uh, no comment. <laughs> yeah, we want to know that, Harvey, but uh, we'll, we'll keep it for another day. There is going to be a report out next month, supposedly, from the government on that subject, so we'll see. Um, yeah, so those are all visual sightings. Yeah, no, apparently you know, there's you know, there, 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 is, there is the SETI Institute, right, which has struggled quite hard to find some semblance of extraterrestrial intelligence and yeah. as far as we know they're they're the aliens are keeping mum on that front <laughs> yeah i know there was some military radar uh, uh that was on the front page of the new york times and washington post but that prompted a uh requirement for a a federal report uh right. which is supposed to come out next month uh so we'll see i guess we'll stay tuned for that one and we'll keep george apprised if he doesn't get beamed up beforehand so That's all Andy. right Andy has a little question. How can active services and passive services work together on spectrum access rather than generally duking it out on a regular basis at various venues? Yeah, so right now everything is based on allocations. And I think as long as that's true, this is going to continue. Right. Uh, allocations are basically fighting over property. Yeah. Um, I, I was looking at Andy's talk. I mean, I, I found Andy's talk extremely interesting because he was describing in detail the coordination mechanisms that were occurring. Um, may, maybe he has something to say about this. I, the coordination mechanisms for the CBRS are somewhat static, right? They're, they're designed to be, uh, they're, they're static by design with perturbations. And he alluded to the difficulties of implementing the uh, the perturbations when he got when he discussed the problems of the environmental sensing, for instance. And then he wanted to replace environmental sensing with a kind of uh, push information. And at that point, then he's getting into a real dynamic spectrum coordination, and that's more along the line of this national radio dynamic zone. But um, I don't pretend to understand what a national radio dynamic zone is. I, the, the recommendations that, that came out of the, the workshop that were presented to COPUS, that's an attempt um, 
to avoid duking it out on a regular basis at various venues. If, if the satellites will just avoid illuminating our radio telescopes, if they could do that, then we wouldn't worry about them, right? They would do what they wanted to, and we would do what we wanted to. Um, and, we, and we hope that something like that is, is possible. Uh, you know, I, you can hear me, I, I'm casting about, but my general feeling is that as long as it's a matter of protecting allocations, this is gonna continue the way it is. And Andy has another comment, which is uh, the Wireless Innovation Forum is looking to talk about implementing a SaaS-like architecture to coordinate between some active and passive services, so, you know, at least on let, a theory. Let me, let me just, you know, Andy, Andy is well aware of some of the difficulties here. Yeah. Um, one of the main difficulties, the way things work now, is that radio telescopes don't have fixed schedules. Um, you've got an instrument like the GBT that can work anywhere from 300 megahertz to 100 gigahertz. Uh, conditions that are suitable for 100 megahertz come and go. And you've got to be able to take advantage of them quickly. Um, but for instance, observing at KU band, observing at K band is often problematical at the GBT as well. So that, you know, it may be difficult to schedule even 19 gigahertz observations. So what do you do when you can't even observe at 19 gigahertz? The answer is you observe at 1400 megahertz. So there are some things that you always have to have available. Well, we've uh, run a little bit over, but that was fascinating. And I hope you can come back and continue this discussion with the mega constellations and all the other issues just unfolding. Uh, we need uh, more, not less dialogue, and maybe we'll up the cadence. Uh, NSMA uh, started a series of webinars, and this could probably use a standalone webinar uh, for sure. Um, uh, we're getting some positive comments. Joseph Miller, Spectrum Lead at USMC, is uh, happy. Uh, well, thanks, guys. James I appreciate Mason, it. A lot of others. So, uh, Harvey, uh, we can't thank you enough for coming back, and we hope we can talk more with you on this. And right. this sort of does, this definitely does fold into the uh, 5G and natural world, really wireless in the natural world, and uh, over uh, interference and uh, coordination issues that are just unfolding. People are just understanding even how to Great. start thinking about I, I look forward to hearing the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much, Jim. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll all uh, see you all uh, momentarily on the next session. 5G in the natural world. Thank you so much.